to guess. Um, then there's one here about uh, opera and conditioning avoids the question of motivation by claiming that it is a function of a previous history of positive reinforcement. But why and at what point do individual organisms begin to respond differently to different reinforcers? That's a very, very hard question to answer, of course. For one thing, uh, when you start to deal with a human organism, let's say at the age of, well, the age of one, let alone uh, the age of 21 or 41, there was an enormous history that you can only guess at. Things that have happened. And under those conditions, uh, I don't know what you can do except uh, make the best guess as to what has probably happened from, in, uh, from some sort of a survey, some, some way of finding out uh, what has actually uh, been going on. Uh, the uh, the uh, basic reinforcers of the human organism are due, I assume, like those of all species, to uh, survival value. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that they are necessarily good. I would like to make a great deal of the fact that we are out of date with respect to our current environment in the sense that we tend to be reinforced by things which no, which no longer need to be that reinforcing for the sake of the survival of the species. Sugar and salt would be examples of this. Uh, until fairly recently, there were very little sugar and salt in the environments of human beings, except in the case of salt, those who lived in Miami and on the, on the ocean. But um, the species had to have these substances. Sugar was, a, sweetness was associated with ripe fruit, and that was about all. And so the salt lick that animals go to a great danger to themselves and so on show you how important it is to be reinforced by salt on the tongue. And until salt was mined and processed and put on every table in salt cellars and on potato chips and all sorts of things like that, it was important uh, that people ate a certain amount of salt. Same thing is true of sugar. Until the discovery of sugar cane and sugar beets and the processing and storage and sale of sugar and the ubiquitous candy counter and so on, it was important that people be reinforced by sugar because if you run on something nutritious and it tastes sweet, it's good to remember where you got it and how to get it again and so on. However, now, of course, these things are so terribly reinforcing that we overeat both of them uh, and uh, <clears throat> get overweight or, uh, or uh, to destroy the, uh, the chemical balance in the, in, the, in the body. Same thing is true of sexual reinforcement. At a time when the species was decimated by famine, pestilence, and what knows, what, and wars, and so on, it was important that human beings copulated every opportunity. And the way that evolved was to make sex extraordinarily reinforcing. Well, now we're overpopulating the world because it is so reinforcing. These are things which that we've changed, but the world has changed, and we no longer need to be this susceptible. Now you can say, well, thank God uh, they are that, that, uh, that reinforcing, and you can use contraceptives and saccharin and uh, artificial salt and so on um, and enjoy, but um, it is a, it's a great problem, and the, and, the, and the world is suffering from, a, from the survival of a feature of the human organism which is no longer appropriate. I think probably signs of aggressive damage would be one of those too. That if you are in a world where you survive only if you fight well, then any sign that you've hurt someone is a very good thing because you learn to fight well if somebody groans or sharp and cries out and so on when you hit them just right. And I dare say there's some tendency to be reinforced when people are hurt. And uh, we find that all the way from schadenfreude and uh, all the way down to watching professional football. But anyway, these are, these are the basic reinforcers. Of course, they then are almost immediately overlaid with conditioned reinforcers, the things that eventually get these things for you. The, what the mother does with the baby is associated with nursing and sweet milk and so on makes whatever the mother does reinforcing. And there's an elaborate uh, set of reinforcers built up there. The social reinforcers, they come from people who treat you well and uh, also the negative ones treat you badly. These are the things that uh, you acquire. But what an individual has acquired in the lifetime when he comes for, say, therapy at the age of 30 or something of that sort, that, uh, I see no, no way of ever finding that out it's in such, to, so that you could actually make use of, of the facts. What you can do is to make a current 
survey of what seems to be reinforcing to this person, and I don't regard that as circular. One of the questions here is, is it true that uh, the whole idea of reinforcement is circular? You, something is reinforcing, get it reinforces. But that's about correct. I think mean, uh, you, you find out what is reinforcing by seeing whether it, in, whether it increases the probability of behavior upon which it is contingent. I mean, that's not, there's no more circular than talking about ferrous metals being magnetic and brass not. What is a magnetic? Well, it's something that, uh, that uh, responds to magnetism, and uh, brass doesn't, and uh, irons do, then uh, then circular, perhaps. It's still a very useful concept. And uh, you, you, you define a reinforcer as something which makes behavior more probable when it is contingent upon the behavior, then uh, that's an observational kind of thing. It is not, I think, basically uh, circular. Um, I think I think I've answered that one essentially. Um, following the publication of About Behavior in 1974, there was criticism regarding the lack of sufficient philosophical foundation. And the question goes on from that a little further. Um, philosophers. Um, have raised the question about my philosophical sophistication. I uh, can't point to any elaborate uh, education in philosophy, but um, I believe that this could be said also, let us say, of the logical positivists who did have uh, a great education in the history of philosophy. There are some points of view which more or less invalidate the whole domain of philosophical inquiry. I used an example this morning of, um, of that sort in my lecture. You can teach a pigeon to name the, a single property of an object. You have some, color, some panels with colors printed on them, and then there are some objects here, and if the object is white, no matter what its shape or size, the pigeon pecks the word, the pan, the word white. And if, it, uh, if it's red, but no matter what the size or shape, it pecks the word red, and so on. And I had a quotation from Karl Popper. This, does this mean that there is an essential property of whiteness, or do we collect a, do we collect a set in terms of that? Or there's an alternative expression I won't go into, but there's, there are complicated philosophical statements of what is going on when a, with respect to the, the essence of, a, of an abstract term of that sort. Well, the contingencies are perfectly obvious, and I insist that the contingencies suffice to, to explain the behavior not only of a pigeon, but of ourselves. When we have settled, uh, we have singled out separate properties of objects and identified them with, with terms. Now, I, it look, may look as if I were, were unsophisticated and unaware of all the discussion that's gone on for 2,500 years about invariance and essences and whatnot, but I'm not. I'm, I'm, I, 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 yes, I, I am. I'm, I'm ignorant of that because I've, I've lost interest in it. But the contingencies of reinforcement provide an alternative that um, seem to me to be much simpler and certainly much closer to a scientific account of the behavior. Um, 